Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Have you ever uh, just taken a moment to observe your, your thought patterns as you are uh, about to engage in some new occasion or some new event? Uh, you just think about uh, something new that might be coming up and how we begin to... I don't know about you, but I, I start to draw images in my mind and expectations in my mind of, of what it's going to look like and how, these are all, how this is going to play out, the people I'm going to see, and, and uh, how I'm going to spend my time. Maybe as you look at uh, all of your summer events and occasions, you consider like a vacation time, and you say, I'm so looking forward to vacation, you know, because I get to just sit on the beach for 100 hours, you know, or whatever your expectation is, you know, you just, or whatever you're, uh, wherever you want to go. But these images you start to drop in your mind, who, how you're going to spend your time, and you bring this pile of books with you, and you're just like, finally, I get to catch up on all my, my reading, or whatever it might be, who, the people you're going to see, the, the places you're going to visit, and the fun things you're going to do. Maybe, uh, Maybe the expectations are as you have a, a business, um, maybe you own a business or maybe you're just part of a, a workforce and, a, and you have maybe a presentation that's coming up and you just have in your mind how this is going to play out and what it's going to do and, and uh, maybe there's a possibility for promotions or, or th- it starts to affect the way that you conduct yourself. Maybe, a, maybe it's a missions trip that's coming up. Some of us have uh, that on our minds as uh, we look at this uh, coming week and we, we think, man, I, all the people that we're going to meet and how this is going to play out and, and uh, we have this uh, idea in our mind of what this ministry is going to look like and how we're going to help these people. Maybe uh, you've had a long day at work uh, this past week, some, one of those days, and you just say, you know, I'm just looking forward to an evening at home with nothing on the calendar or the schedule. Uh, I... Uh, I just want to break away from everybody just to sit and do nothing, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, maybe it's a, a date with your spouse or with that special guy or that special gal, and you're looking forward to that. And in your mind, you're drawing up all these ideas of what it's going to look like and how it's going to turn out and, and where you're going to go and what you're going to do. Um, this past week we took the teens up to Valley Fair and so there were just so many kids so excited about their trip to Valley Fair they just couldn't wait they were so excited until they got off that ride Um, you know the scenario changes a little bit right it kind of oftentimes turns your head and your stomach the wrong ways and you just think whoa what in the world was I what was I expecting that to do you know I mean (laughs) we'll look at that thing Um, maybe uh Maybe you look forward this week to uh, just a fireworks display that you're going to go visit somewhere and you just say, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be great, it's going to be fantastic. And I don't know about you, but there have been a number of fireworks displays that I've uh, just really been in anticipation of. It's promised to be the best one in the whole state, you know, and you go up there and, and something goes drastically wrong, you know, with the fireworks. And it's uh, a number of years ago here in Rochester, it was like a it all went off all at the same time, and it was like a, like a four-minute show, and you're like, that was it? I mean, it was huge, but that was it? You're like, wow, this is impressive. Anyway, what happened? But expectations, right? We plan and we dream because we want things to work out just perfect. Uh, your college roommate is going to be everything that you expected them to be, Right? Until you get there, right? And your, your, your marriage is, you know, you have this idea of what it's going to look like and what it's going to be. And maybe it's that new house. You're going to move across town because you're tired of this one. You want a new house. Maybe it's a new car. You know, I'm tired of the old clunker, you know. And finally a new car until all of a sudden the brand new car has problems, you know. Um, maybe it's a new workout program. You're like, this is gonna, this is gonna change everything. This is gonna, this is it. I mean, you know, I've got expectations of this workout program, or maybe it's a new sports team that you're a part of and you're anticipating the roles that you get to play in uh, being a part of that athletic team. Uh, maybe it's a brand new electronic device. You're like, man, mine is so slow and I can hardly wait because this one is gonna solve all my problems, right? 
Uh, technology doesn't solve all your problems, okay? We, we're learning this, right? We know this. But, uh, maybe it's a wilderness trip. We came back from a wilderness trip a couple weeks ago here and uh, had some of my own expectations of what this trip was going to look like. I thought, finally, I'm going to have plenty of time to spend in God's word without distraction and... Uh, you know, in the past, wilderness trips, I've learned to kind of be guarded about my expectations, about how things are going to play out and, and what's going to happen and what the week's going to look like. Because I've learned that God always seems to have a way of disrupting those plans uh, to teach me something different. He, he just, he, uh, he is sovereign and he allows the circumstances and events in our lives to disrupt those things um, so that I can just see him a little bit more clearly. But for whatever reason, I, uh, I really felt like my expectations were different. I felt like uh, I found, you know, that, man, I'm going to go there and I'm going to have extra time to, to spend with the Lord. And, and what I found at the, at the end of each day is we, you know, get up early and we would travel and, or move around or whatever. And, and I would just get back. I would be completely exhausted, just utterly exhausted and uh, more than usual for some reason. And it wasn't that it was a terribly difficult trip, but uh, we were just seemed to be battling winds and, and uh, difficulties, you know, through uh, the adventure there. But um, I just, every time I sat down to read, I just felt like I just, I just couldn't settle into his thoughts. I just, has a, just struggled. Have you ever been there? You just open up God's word and you just feel like, man, Lord, I'm really struggling here. I want to connect. I want to, want to hear your voice through your word here and, and I need your help here and you're, you're praying and asking the Lord to help you to see that. And um, then there were moments when I was ready to do that. I felt ready and I'd sit down and it would pour rain. <laughs> How are you supposed to open your Bible and protect it from the rain? You know, you get in your tent and, and uh, man, we got wet. We got wet uh, on our wilderness trip and we were studying Luke uh, chapter 9. And that's where I want to take you uh, this morning. Luke chapter 9 this morning. One of the things that God was teaching me on that trip was that there are, there are moments in my life where I am prone to consider the benefits to myself. I'm prone to consider how this is going to benefit me. Uh, how is this going to play out for my own comfort, for my own ease, for my own glory, really? Uh, and I don't say those out loud. I wouldn't admit that. I wouldn't say those things. But really, when I evaluate my heart, I'm, I'm looking for ways to, uh, to um, make this play out so that I can consider how this is going to benefit me. And our first day out on the wilderness trip, uh, we were headed out on Moose Lakes. Maybe a number of you have been there before, but the lake kind of angles northeast. And so we were headed up that lake, a moose and Newfound, and we were getting ready to head up the knife uh, Lake, uh, knife, knife Lake and Knife River up there along the Canadian border. And, uh, you know, all the years that I've gone into Moose Lake, uh, it's always been uh, the wind with us going in and the wind uh, against us coming out. And we're paddling in and the wind is in our face. It's going against us. And to boot, there's people that are coming out and they're just smiling and they're just sailing on their way out. And I'm just thinking, oh, you got to be kidding me. I've never had... A, a tailwind on the way out of here. I've always battled the winds on the way out of here. We planned our whole trip uh, to be just a little bit different so that we would have, uh, we could get up really early and beat the winds so that we could get out and not have to face the, the front winds, the headwinds coming out of there, you know. But I'm watching these people just smiling. I mean, they might as well have put their tarps up and just sailed right on out of there. I mean, they were, they were just having a great time. And we're like paddling like crazy, you know, to get in. By the time we got into camp that first day, I was, it wasn't a horribly exhausting trip. I've been on worse, but it was, it was tiring. And uh, we got into camp that night and uh, we were tired and uh, just wanted to get settled down. And just as we get into camp, it just, it, the storm hit. Maybe some of you are watching the radar as we were uh, hitting into camp and we, we had the little tracker so that you could follow us. But man, it, it poured. It poured rain and um, it drenched everything. And all of a sudden, all of our efforts together changed to uh, just the basic necessities, food, shelter, food, shelter. <laughs> How do I get the fire going so that we can cook our dinner and get to bed, right? I mean, that's all that we really was on our agenda, just some temporary physical needs that we had. But we were tired, we were hungry, and we were wet. And I don't know about you, but when those three things are all combined together, they tend to affect our attitudes, 
Have you, have you ever noticed that? Um, I mean, sometimes it's just tired, you know, oh, they're just tired, as if it's an excuse, you know, to act poorly and mistreat other people, but, uh, or, well, you know, they're just, they're just hungry, they haven't eaten yet, you know, and as if that's an excuse to, to mistreat other people, but, but now you add tired and hungry and wet, and they're all combined together here, and, and there's a group of us trying to huddle around, we're holding tarps over the top of people that are trying to set up a tent so that their tent doesn't get wet while they're trying to set it up, I'm trying to start a fire, and it is just pouring rain while I'm trying to start the fire, nobody he's holding a tarp over me, of course. Anyway, so here I am trying to get this fire going, and, and I'm just like, I'm so hungry. Let's just eat, and let's just go to bed. And what happened was we, we talked about this whole event the next day as we're uh, paddling out on the lake. We had an opportunity to go out to a, an overlook, and uh, it was just beautiful to be able to see that and just reflect a little bit on some of the things that God had been teaching us. And we started looking at the previous night, and I just thought, man, I was very unthankful. I was so unthankful. In fact, I think we ate dinner. I, I don't remember specifically, but I think we ate dinner. We just chowed it down and we just went to our tents and went to bed. And I don't remember giving thanks to the Lord for the food that night. I just don't remember. Um, if we did, <laughs> I sure didn't feel, it, feel like uh, I was very thankful. And uh, sometimes just the combination of different circumstances tend to start to affect our attitudes. And, and I guess the question today is, what happens when our expectations have not been realized? When things don't go the way that we expect, when illness hits or sickness or uh, some accident or incident or some work-related problem or a relationship problem or trouble hits and, and just trouble hits home, what happens when those things uh, hit us and uh, we get out on those vacation mindsets and have all these ideas of what this is going to look like what it's going to be like and how it's going to play out and then things change <laughs> God changes them you realize that God allows them to change consider how expectations this morning frame our outlook and alter our attitudes how do our expectations frame kind of puts your whole life experience into a picture frame and you start to see life through that little picture frame and it starts to change the way that you see life. It changes your attitude. We paint that picture. And I agree, sometimes God graces us with experiences that go the way that we've planned. But you know that that is a grace of God. Uh, when you plan those things out and God does oftentimes allow our plans to uh, play out the way that we pictured and we just, man, that was really great. It worked out perfect. It was exactly the way I pictured it. But that's, that's a grace of God. More often than not, we know that that's not the case, right? Things do change. And uh, how do I respond when they do, when they change? Uh, if it doesn't happen the way that I expected it to happen, then I'm going to be unhappy. You know, you've heard the phrase, if mom or daddy isn't happy, then nobody's happy, right? <laughs> why? Why does that have to be? You know, but why? Because I want to make sure that when things haven't gone the way that I wanted them to, I want to make sure that other people are aware of the fact that I have been disappointed. Okay? And I want you to be sympathetic to my disappointment. Would you just acknowledge my suffering? Would you just acknowledge my pain? <laughs> and when the expectations don't go our way, we're going to make other people's lives miserable because we're miserable. Do you ever feel that way? Or watch other, it's easier to watch other people who are doing that, right? It's a lot easier to see other people doing that, but admit it, you do it, right? Uh, we're there. And uh, we've been studying Philippians with pastor and uh, Paul said in Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, there is nothing, in nothing I should be ashamed, but with all boldness, with all boldness, and as always, that Christ would be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. How do I live my life through the experiences of life so that the word I'm after here is the word magnified? so that my life magnifies Jesus Christ. You say, that's really strange. That's a strange term. How in the world does my life magnify the King of glory? Who am I to magnify him? Well, if you consider just the idea of a telescope, 
A telescope is an instrument that is used to gaze at, for instance, stars. But a telescope is way, way smaller than a star, isn't it? I mean, you consider the size of a star compared to the size of a telescope. What is a telescope? That it would draw a star closer. What is a telescope that it would, uh, that it would magnify and help you to see more clearly the magnificence of a star. Your life, friends, is a telescope. Your life is a telescope to a watching world of people that it would magnify and draw them closer, see more clearly who Jesus is. That my attitudes, that my expectations in this life would magnify the King of glory. They would see me not for who I am. They would see through my life and they would see something different. They would see a Christ that they've never seen before. They would see him lifted up. Philippians 2, Paul said, let this mind, or literally let this attitude be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And he's, the, the reference is uh, to the humility and to the response of serving other people in that passage. And that mindset and that attitude is an attitude of others focused. And that's what we've been learning with pastors. We've been going through this, uh, through Philippians here together. How, how do I see my life filtered through the lens of other people? It's not that I shouldn't have plans. It's not that I shouldn't have expectations. There are multiple references in scriptures to, related to stewardship and planning and, and making uh, the plans and, and, and anticipating that, that things would turn out. But the issue at hand as we walk through this passage in Luke 9 together today is what happens when those plans change? I plan, I have my expectations, I've got it all figured out, and then God intervenes and allows those things to alter. That's the issue that we're after today. What is my attitude when God changes those plans, when he allows them to be altered through various circumstances and events? Luke chapter 9 with me this morning, starting in verse 10. I know you are really familiar with this story, but just engage with me for a minute because I see some things here from our wilderness trip experience, from my experience, that uh, I think are going to be helpful to all of us. Let me start in verse 10 of Luke chapter 9. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. And he took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. And the crowds found out they followed him and they welcomed him. He welcomed them and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God and, and he cured those who needed healing. Late in the day, <laughs> tired, weary, right? The 12 approached him and they said, send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging because we are in a deserted place here. You give them something to eat, Jesus told them. Well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said, unless we go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men there. And he told the disciples, have each of them sit down in groups of about 50. And so they did, and they sat down. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke it, and he kept giving to the disciples to set before the crowd. And everyone ate and was filled, and they picked up 12 baskets left over pieces. And then a period of time later, while he was praying in private, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, and he said, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, Elijah, still others, that you're one of the ancient prophets that's come back. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? I think that like the disciples when we get into situations and circumstances of uh, expectation, we are often prone to look at the benefits to ourselves. How is this going to play out to benefit me? And I just, uh, as I process through this passage, I just had a few points here this morning that I wanted to walk through with you. And the first one is I think we're prone to think highly of our own accomplishments. Just like the disciples, we're prone to think highly of our own accomplishments. If you look at chapter 9 and verse 1, 
it tells us what the disciples are reporting to Jesus. It said in uh, 9-1, summoning the 12, Jesus gave them power and authority over demons, the power to heal diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. You, you realize the power and the authority that God gave them, the power which is the ability and the authority which is the right to do those things. He is the one that, that gave them that opportunity and that privileged status. And they go out and they spend all day long doing these things. Man, they are out there and they are just serving and serving and serving. All four Gospels account for this particular story of the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, all of them report to Jesus what they had done. It said at the beginning of our passage, they come back from this exhausting day of work and they report to Jesus what they had done. Jesus didn't ask them. They just told them, told him all the things that they had done, all the things that they had, had, uh, had uh, accomplished during that day. And I realize the passage doesn't explicitly say uh, or tell us their mindset or their attitude, but I think as you, the passage unfolds, I'm not far off here in realizing because, uh, because of where this goes and their attitude towards other people and what they're thinking, as they come back to report to Jesus, the question is, who's looking to get the credit here? Who's looking to get the credit here? There's nothing condemning about the work that they did. Jesus asked them to do that. The work that they did was, was to be honoring to the Lord and to point people to the Lord. And they undoubtedly were exhausted as they come back. But I think the disciples came back and reported to Jesus because they wanted Jesus to acknowledge their hard work and their need for food and for rest. <laughs> Somebody acknowledge how much we've done here. The bottom line, they wanted some credit here. They wanted somebody to acknowledge what they had done. Who gave them the power? Who gave them the authority? Who put them in that privileged status to be able to do all the things that they did all that day? Who gave that to them? And they're looking and they're fishing for this opportunity to get a little bit of the glory for themselves. Oh, friends, how easy it is when you've been working really hard Hear me, how easy it is to drop hints about how busy we've been, right? I mean, I, uh, I have to guard myself. Well, how are you doing? Oh, man, I'm so busy. Man, I have to be careful. Why? why? Why would I want to acknowledge that? What's the reason for stating that? Or how hard we've been working, how, how incredibly difficult things have been. I'm fishing for an opportunity for somebody to say, oh man, you're right, you have been working hard. You deserve a break, right? You deserve some rest. Somebody acknowledge my suffering. Somebody acknowledge my pain. Somebody be sympathetic to me, right? And the passage unfolds as we see the disciples uh, not only have the high, expect, high expectation of, the, of their own accomplishments and the things that they've done, but secondly, I think they're prone to expect comfort and ease. Uh, rest is really important. Uh, we don't deny that. Even Jesus promoted the idea of rest. Let's go apart and rest for a while. Rest is really, really important. But I just ask, what happens when your plans for rest and relaxation are altered. What happens when those plans are disrupted? You can almost picture the smile on the disciples' faces here in this passage. When he said to them, he took them along and withdrew privately with them. And Mark, the accountant Mark says, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest a while. So Jesus' words were exactly an invitation to, let's get out of here, let's go rest. And I could almost just see the disciples just smiling, can't you? Oh, yes. In fact, uh, 
They, uh, they had been working hard all day long and they're just expecting the opportunity to just sit down, get off their feet and relax. You understand this, don't you? I mean, there have been days when you've been working really hard in the hot sun and uh, you can just hardly wait to get to that shower, jump in the lake, jump in the pool and you're just like, and there's a, there's a sense in which the motivation of that uh, expected event to come, just it, it can put a smile on your face sometimes. You're like, <laughs> man, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be so great, right? But what happens when those plans are disrupted? What happens when the expectation that I have for comfort and for ease and relaxation changes? What happens? Well, what happened with the disciples? What happened in the account with the disciples? Because it was late in the day. And the passage tells us that we have a tendency to push other, the disciples did, they had a tendency to, third, push other people away. Why? They wanted their relaxation. They wanted their peace. They wanted their comfort. And as they, late in the day, the, the disciples come to Jesus and say, send the crowds away. And they're coming off these privileged ministry opportunities. And all of a sudden, the disciples feel that their privileged status now gives them the right to be Jesus' advisors. Did you catch that? They, they come and they, they approach Jesus and they have some advice and some counsel for Jesus now. I think you should send the crowds away. I think you should send these people away because what are they doing here? What are, they, what are they looking for? Why are they pushing the people away? Well, Jesus didn't have the same mindset, did he? Jesus got a little bit upset and his comment right back to them was very firm. You, you give them something to eat. What, 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 are, what is going on here, man? Why are, why are we so inwardly focused here all of a sudden? What are your expectations about your time of rest and this, this time of getting away? But Jesus, Jesus saw the need of the moment as these people flooded in. They followed him around the edge of the lake. They come over to him and they're, they're just hungry to meet with Jesus. And uh, as they approach him, Jesus, I think it's important to know this. Jesus didn't, meet the needs of every single person he encountered. We know that. He didn't, he didn't meet the needs of every single person that he encountered, like all the beggar, all the people that came. But, but Jesus knew the ones that were a priority and the whole, he was in tune with God the Father. And he knew what was most important. And he saw, and the passage tells us that he had a heart of compassion for these people. The other gospels elaborate on it a little bit more. In fact, um, it tells us that he had a compassion as, they, as though they were sheep wandering about without a shepherd. As though these people who are in desperate need of, of uh, something spiritual, they wanted a, a connection, a relationship with God, and he knew that. Life is not about trying to figure out how to please people. It's not about pleasing people, but it's also not trying to figure out how to get people out of the way so that I can get the things that I want. There is a balance here as we are in tune with the Holy Spirit of God and spending time with, his, in, with him and his word and saying, God, what do you have in store for me here today? Who are the people that you're bringing into my path that I could minister to, that I could serve, and, and to not push people away? And I think one of the things to realize is that, that we tend to have, fourthly, a skewed view about the, the needs of people around us. Um, the disciples said, why don't you send them away? Why? To go find food and lodging for themselves, as if the food and the lodging were the most important needs of their life. It's like the disciples found this way of, they, they were trying to make it sound like, uh, this is really for the benefit of the people, Jesus. Uh, I mean, this, this is really, we're, we're, we're looking out for the needs of these people. I mean, please understand, Jesus, uh, if you send these people away, then they can get something to eat, right? But underlying all that, Jesus knew right to their heart. He knew exactly what was going on here. They weren't in this for their benefit, they were in it because they wanted their peace and their relaxation and their comfort, right? That's what they were looking for. And Jesus saw right through to that. He saw the upper, the, what they were after. It wasn't that. But Jesus, in his compassion, saw the needs of these people and wanted to minister to them. I think sometimes, too, um, we get prone to question God's abilities to provide. 
because Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. And their, their immediate response, right away, <laughs> without batting an eye, they said, but, but we don't have, we don't have, where are we going to get this kind of food? Not only do they feel like they're Jesus' advisors, but now all of a sudden these, these disciples are now experts in God's economy and wealth. <laughs> right? Right? We know we don't have the resources, Lord. They're just not here. We just can't even do that. And then some of the gospel accounts go into like the specific money amounts of how much money it would cost to feed all of these people. We just don't have it, Lord. It's just not here. It's not possible. Do you ever feel that way sometimes? Well, I just, Lord, we don't know what we're going to do because we just don't have the money for this, Lord. Man, woe is me, right? <laughs> we just don't, we're just not going to be able to do this. And we forget about God's provision and God's ability. In John chapter 6, when he accounts of this experience, he said, collect all the leftovers so that there is nothing wasted. Man, that just struck me as a, as a, abundance of God's provision. It just struck me that God is, God is not only the supplier of our needs, but he is the abundant supplier. He has, his wealth is unbelievable. If we just acknowledge him, if we just cry out to him, he knows our needs. He is the one that is able to provide and he's not going to provide everything I want. He's going to take care of my needs. Sometimes you adventure off into certain opportunities and you say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to provide for this, but, but when you do it by faith, does God provide? Every single time, doesn't he? Many of you are shaking your heads because you know, because you have seen and you have watched God's hand of provision in your life abundantly to take care of all that you need. And it is, it's all that you need. And he is so good. He is so good. And yet, we are so prone to forget his abundant provision. That first night in the wilderness trip, we were wet, we were cold, we were tired, we were hungry. <laughs> and our minds are just focused on getting to bed and getting our food and man, just so unthankful. Oh, everything that we needed was right there. God was so good. And he always is. It doesn't matter where you are, your proximity, your location, all the things that, that God has in store for you, he is so good. And I think it ties in here that we are, again, just prone to be unthankful. I'm sure the disciples were incredibly humbled as they watched Jesus give thanks. They just stand there and, and they take, takes the five loaves and the two fishes and, and he just gives thanks. And it, it probably just rocked the disciples a little bit to say, whoa, <laughs> what? okay, all right. He's giving thanks for five loaves and two fish. What's he gonna do with five loaves and two fish? I mean, that's all we have here. I mean, and, the, and, and, and then they watch the food multiply in their very hands as they pass it out. Could you just imagine being one of those disciples just just incredibly humbled by his hand of provision and his great abundance to meet the needs of those people. Well, the passage um, goes on to tell us, and, and Luke skips right to this, uh, this exchange of words here. Other gospel accounts have a series of some other events that take place here, but I, I think Luke, by intention, jumps right from the feeding of the 5,000 right to this statement where he says, who do the crowds say that I am? And, and I think he does that because in times of certain circumstances, we are prone to start to value the opinions of other people. We start to weigh in too heavily on the opinions of other people. Um, it's not that listening to other people is bad. In fact, we should, and we should get the counsel and the wisdom of others. We, uh, there is, in a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom, right? And so we need to seek counsel, seek advice of other people. But what happened was the, the disciples had been putting their ears out there to listen to what the crowds have said about one very major important doctrine here. <laughs> Who is Jesus. Who do the crowds say that I am? And what's interesting is they had answers for this, which tells me that they had been listening to the people. Well, John the Baptist or Elijah or, or some prophet that has come back. Or, and, and they knew what the people were saying about who Jesus was. They'd been listening. They'd been talking to them. 
And I just say as we listen to the counsel of other people, there's one really important filter that we need to run that through. The counsel that we receive from other people, is it being filtered through the question, who do you say that I am? Who have you come to the conclusion that Jesus really is? Do you know who Jesus is? And that confession statement by Peter, that he is the Messiah, is really foundational to the entire passage. Because if your eyes get off of Jesus, you are prone to filter the circumstances of your life through how they are going to benefit you. You are prone to see the events of your life as what's in it for me? How is this going to help me? When am I going to get my rest? When do I get my vacation? When do I have the right to do this or to do that? Or why can't I have what those people have? And we start to, to run our lives through that grid when we take our eyes off of Jesus. And that really important question for us this week, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? So as you anticipate various events this week, filter your expectations through this grid. Is my attitude going to be the telescope that makes Jesus bigger in the eyes of people that are watching? Are my expectations and my attitudes of all the things that happen in my life this week, is it going to communicate to the people that I come into contact with? Is it going to bounce off of me and reflect and help them to see and magnify Jesus? I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.